our, our next speaker is Thomasina Moore, um, and she's going to talk to us about uh, preserving constitutional and uh, statutory challenges and the, uh, the quirks and intricacies of uh, that specific area. Uh, Thomasina is the Director of Appeals and Pro Bono Initiatives for the Florida Statewide Guardian Ad Litem Program. Um, she's a great friend and, and partner of the Appellate Practice Section's Pro Bono Committee. Uh, Thomasina is a summa cum laude graduate of Nova Southeastern's Law School, where she finished second in her class. Uh, she's a past member of the Board of Directors of the Tallahassee Women Lawyers Association, and she has spearheaded numerous pro bono initiatives, including the uh, Fall in Love with Gal Mentoring Initiative and the Defending Best Interest Project um, that, that is a partner with the Appellate Practice Section. Um, and so again, as I mentioned, Thomasina is going to be covering uh, preservation issues surrounding constitutional and statutory challenges, which is an area she has a lot of expertise in. And so without further ado, I'll turn things over to Thomasina now. Thank you. And um, before I got started, Joe, you so kindly thank all of us for our role today. And I wanted to start by thanking you um, for the last three and a half years while I've worked on this project and with the pro bono committee, you've just been rock solid in your support and in helping us make sure everything flows along. So thank you for making this happen today. The topic I'm presenting today is preserving constitutional and statutory challenges. I did want to start off by letting everybody know that my presentation is intended to be a very high level overview. Um, I kept it short intentionally because it's either going to be very short and give you the high level overview or we could spend several hours, I think, on the topic itself. So as we go through this, I will not dive into any of it. I will be available afterwards to answer questions. You'll see my email address at the end of the presentation and I'll take a few questions at the end, but we're um, going to move along to keep everyone on track, as I said. So with that, I'm going to move into discussing the types of challenges. And what we have are, are two different types of challenges with the um, constitutional challenges. You can have a facial challenge or an as-applied challenge. Before we walk through each one and what the requirements are for them, I just wanted to compare and contrast the two of them for you. A facial challenge is one in which the plaintiff is claiming that under all circumstances, the statute is unconstitutional. The goal is to have it declared facially invalid, which is why they refer to them as facial challenges, so that it can never be applied to anybody. In contrast, an as-applied challenge is one that looks at the statute of regulation and makes the allegation that it is unconstitu unconstitutional in a specific context. The plaintiff in an as-applied challenge is not trying to argue the invalidity of the entire statute. Instead, they're trying to say that it's being applied in an unconstitutional manner. And in that sense, it is considered as trying to narrow the breadth of the statute rather than declare the statute as a whole invalid. So what do you have to do to prove facial challenges? So we move into the different grounds, you'll see that too. Prove a facial constitutional challenge, you have to show that there is no set of circumstances under which the statute would be valid. Um, that's our ruling of the Florida Supreme Court. It follows a ruling of the U.S. Supreme Court going back quite a ways um, to a Salerno case, and the Florida has adopted it for its own. Interestingly, or at least to those of us that are geeky enough about constitutional law, um, the U.S. Supreme Court is starting to move away from this um, standard in some circumstances, but as recently as 2018, the first district said the U.S. Supreme Court may be, but the Florida Supreme Court has not shown its inclination to do that, so we're sticking with it. So after you show there there is no set of circumstances, the next thing the court considers is the text of the statute not its uh, application to a particular set of circumstances. Um, for those of you who follow Supreme Court opinions of Florida, you'll know last January of last year, they entered an opinion that discussed reading the text of the statute. So that's something that um, is 
gaining in opinions and in arguments within the courts, you're going to see a lot of textualist arguments and cites to Scalia and Garner. The facial challenges, because they seek to have the entire statute declared invalid, may be raised for the first time on appeal. It does not have to be preserved in the lower court. These challenges are very difficult to plead and prove, and that is by design. Courts like context, courts like actual cases and controversies. So they have intentionally limited the ability to be able to raise facial challenges and succeed on them because they do prefer to have an as applied challenge in order to be able to judge the statute in its context. It, that's been referred to um, by the court as letting democracy um, work and, and seeing it progress. So what do you have to do for an as applied challenge? For an as applied challenge, you have to prove that the application of the challenge statute is unconstitutional under the particular circumstances present in the case. As applied challenges consider the facts and um, will also consider the um, any set of facts that it can it can be looked at. So for an as applied challenge, you must preserve the argument in the trial court. You cannot raise an as applied challenge for the first time on appeal. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the facial challenge is very difficult, but here as applied challenges are less difficult to succeed because you're focused on your particular case and what you need to do for your challenge to succeed, not one that invalidates the entire statute. So again, preserving constitutional challenges, as I mentioned, for an as applied constitutional challenge for appeal, you have to timely raise the issue for the trial court's consideration. And if applicable, you must also comply with the notice requirements of Rule 1.071. I'm going to go through those a little bit more at the end of the presentation. You have to be careful when you are in the trial court, though, not to get yourself in a situation where you've raised your constitutional challenges. For instance, if a defendant pleads no context, con contest, they may have a problem raising a challenge in the trial court or appellate court. Another example of this is when a defendant waives the right to uh, challenge constitutionality was found in context of sex offender registration statute by entering a plea of no context. So you have to be very careful, particularly in the criminal context, uh, for those in dependency court and delinquency court, uh, crossover children or just delinquency, just check and make sure that by entering a plea, you're not waiving any constitutional challenges. Right, so what are the guidelines for judicial review of constitutional challenges? Um, that is what you might feel like if, you know, um, every, everybody has a cat or an animal, they might be next to you, I don't. So I, I have my uh, little kitty on my screen that is scrutinizing us with intense groups. Um, but the courts do that in particular with cases where you have a fundamental right or, and the court is considering a constriction of that fundamental right. In that case, they will use a strict scrutiny standard. Uh, examples of fundamental rights include right to vote, a right to marry, and very often raised in dependency cases are the right to parents to make child rearing decisions. When you have a challenge to a statute that constricts a fundamental right, the burden shifts to the state. And the state has to prove that the legislation serves a compelling state interest and that the legislation substantially furthers that interest through the least restrictive means. Anyone who's done a dependency case knows that in every case, then one of the elements that has to be proven is least restrictive means element. And of course, for the 
compelling state interest that's usually very easily met um, because you're talking about protection of children. Conversely, let's look at standards for rational basis arguments. Rational basis is going to be a much easier um, uh, test for the state to meet. The fundamental right is not at stake. Courts apply the rational basis test. Fundamental rights include uh, non-fundamental rights. You, I think of things that require licensing or permitting, such as the right to drive. Right to be free from a statutory cap on non-economic damages is one that the civil practitioners in the group will often see. When they have the rational basis test, the court's inquiry is whether it is conceivable that the regulatory classification bears some rational relationship to a legitimate state purpose. It is much easier test for the state to meet. And unlike strict scrutiny, the burden of proof is not on the state, but on the party challenging the statute of regulation. So strict scrutiny, fundamental right, state's going to have to prove that um, those three prongs are met, rational basis test, the challenger is going to have to prove no, no rational basis exists for the law. So when you, if you take an appeal of a constitutional challenge, you're going to want to know the standard of review and for standard for constitutionality of a statute is de novo because it is a pure question of law. However, even when looking at de novo, courts will look at questions of historical fact or relevant or necessary to make constitutional um, decisions. And I've seen that often in cases where you have an as applied and so they're looking at historical fact to see what the state's rational basis is for the law that it has enacted. An example would be in a curfew case where they look at um, why the state um, developed the curfew and, and looked at crime rates, which the state has said was the reason for the need for the curfew. Again, the, when you have rational basis, the statute's gonna come to the court closed with the presumption of correctness and all reasonable doubts about the statute's validity must be resolved in favor of constitutionality. That is going to be true when you have a rational basis claim. That is not going to be true when you have strict scrutiny because the burden of proof has been shifted to the state. Just underscoring that exception is strict scrutiny. Thus, even when the order on review has struck a statute, the appellate court in its de novo review must still accord legislative acts a presumption of constitutionality and construe challenge legislation to affect a constitutional outcome wherever possible. And again, that is for rational basis challenges, not constitutional um, strict scrutiny challenges. So what are the notice requirements? I think um, this is an interesting point. Um, where a lot of people don't know where the notice requirements come from or where they're found. And they're actually found in the declaratory judgment statute in section 86091 of Florida statutes. And within the declaratory judgment statute, there is the provision that where a statute charter ordinance or franchise is alleged to be unconstitutional, the attorney general or the state attorney of the judicial circuit in which the action is pending shall be served with a copy of the complaint and be entitled to be heard. So it, it comes from that. And again, if you're not familiar with the declaratory judgment statute, you could easily overlook that requirement, but it is applicable um, in all proceedings where that allegation is made. And if you're in a civil proceeding, um, Florida Rule of uh, Civil Procedure 1.071 has additional requirements for what you must do to comply with section 86091. And in it, you have to promptly file a notice of constitutional question, stating question and identifying the document that raises it, and serve the notice and the pleading, written motion, or other document drawing into question the constitutionality of a state statute or county municipal charter ordinance or franchise on the attorney general or state attorney of the judicial circuit in which the action is pending by either certified or registered mail. So there are real strict requirements in 1.071. Do you want to point out though that 
1.071 is not applicable in dependency proceedings under uh, Rule 800. It is uh, specifically exempt, and the court noted in the rule uh, committee comments that the rule is intended to be self-relying um, and do not look at the rules of civil procedure. And the first DCA has um, recently in the BS case that um, was cited shown that you do not um, go outside those rules to 1.071. And now moving on to the next next slide. Again, under Rule 1.071, notice must be promptly filed. If it's late or um, a late attempted amendment notice, it will not suffice. An example of that is trying to add new grounds. Um, I think every one of us has probably filed a, a motion and amended it later, and that is not um, going to work with the notice for a constitutional challenge. You have to raise them in your original promptly filed notice. The notice has to be complete and expressly identify each constitutional ground for the challenge. If you don't specify the constitutional ground, it may not be considered. Um, so that is important because even if you argue it at the hearing and opposing counsel doesn't object and you end up arguing it um, basically by consent, um, that might not fly for review you have to identify the grounds in your original notice. And so failure to comply with those procedural rule, that procedural rule will bar consideration of a claim on appeal that would have resulted or might result in the striking of a state statute is unconstitutional. All right, so this helpful, this form um, from 1.975 is a form that is adopted for use with the rules of civil procedure. However, I'd suggest that for anybody that has to comply with Section 86091, that this is a very useful form for you to use because it just sets forth everything in there and lets the court know and um, all the other parties know that you have done what was needed in order to um, give notice of the constitutional challenge. Uh, so now we're going to do our uh, question and answer session. I don't see that we have any uh, questions here. Um, if anybody does have them, feel free to put them into the box. If not, that's perfect because we're about to head into a little break so we can give everybody a uh, few minutes to stretch and step away from their screen or answer some emails or whatever anybody needs to do. Um, so I don't see I don't see any and questions. So thank oh. I was going to say please feel free to email me um, if you think of something later or if you're in the middle of a proceeding and this comes up, I am available at the email address shown below.